Today, I'm going to be speaking about Carmine Persico, and more specifically, something I've always found both interesting and somewhat surprising, which was the unwavering loyalty he received. Carmine Persico can be traced back to the days of Joe Profaci. His youthful years growing up in South Brooklyn was spent as a member of the Garfield Boys, along with his friends, the Gallo Brothers, and he was specifically close to Joey Gallo. In fact, as soldiers in the Profaci family, it's believed that Persico and Gallo were part of a hit team that took out Albert Anastasia on October 25, 1957. Shortly after, trouble began brewing between the Gallo crew and their boss, Profaci. Initially, Persico naturally sided with the Gallos. However, following a baseless peace agreement by Profaci, he managed to convince Persico to double-cross his friends. And the Gallo crew was clueless to Persico's betrayal up until when he almost strangled Larry Gallo to death at the Sahara Lounge in Brooklyn. Had it not been for a policeman and a sergeant who decided to walk in and check on a lounge, Larry Gallo would be dead. Could you imagine when he told his brother that it was Persico who tried to strangle him? As a result of his double cross in the Gallows, Persico was christened with his infamous nickname, the Snake. The Gallo crew did try to seek revenge on Persico in May 1963 when members of a Gallo hit team pulled alongside of a car containing Persico and Alphonse D'Ambrosio, who were both shot several times. Persico took one of the bullets to the mouth and supposedly spit the bullet out and drove D'Ambrosio and himself to the hospital. One of the greatest misconceptions about the mob is its being an honorable society. Conversely, treachery and betrayal actually display dishonor. More importantly, the mob and its history is not only replete with dishonor, but it's accepted. Case in point, you would think a guy like Persico, who turned on his friends, even setting one up to be murdered, would never be trusted again by anyone in an honest society. Yet he rose to become the boss of a family. In a strange coincidence, Joe Colombo gave his boss, Joe Magliocco, up in his and Joe Bonanno's plot to take out commission members. As a reward, he was given the title of boss to the family that still bears his name to this very day. Under Colombo's rule, he elevated Persico to a captain's position. As a captain, Persico would flourish as his crew was one of the family's biggest earners. In the early 70s, following a fifth trial for hijacking and conspiracy to hijack, Persico was convicted. The government had called the surprise witness at that trial, which was none other than Joe Valachi. Valachi testified to a conversation he had with Persico. He wanted some advice. He knew I'd been around. And I knew who he was, and he knew who I was through friends. He wanted to know. First, he told me he'd been paying taxes on all the hijackings that he's been pulling, especially the one that he's on trial for, the Akers truck. He paid Joe Profaci $1,800. He wanted to know if he was in his rights, having trouble with Joe Profaci. Well, in my experience, I was astounded. I told him, it's not taxes at all. It was an out-and-out -out shakedown, and he was 100% right in having trouble with Joe Profaci. Persico would be sentenced to 14 years on that case in January 1972, and I believe he only served eight years on that. As for the Gallo crew, Joe Gallo classed with Joe Colombo as well. And on June 28, 1971, while at an Italian Unity Day rally in Columbus Circle in Manhattan, Joe Colombo was shot. Most people believe Joe Gallo sent the black guy who shot Colombo. In turn, the Colombo family exacted their revenge on Joe Gallo while he dined at Umberto's Clam House on April 7, 1972. Gallo was shot to death while celebrating his birthday. Following Colombo's shooting, Joe Iacovelli took over as the family boss, although some say he was keeping the seat warm for Persico, who was in prison. But following the Gallo murder, Iacovelli fled New York, which led to several Colombo members, including Persico's brother, Alley Boy, that would hold the acting boss position. More crucially, it was understood who would officially take the boss position, and no one challenged him. For instance, it's believed that Thomas DeBella, who in some FBI reports has as the Colombo boss, yet in another report, they have Persico as the boss. Both reports were created a year after Persico began serving his hijacking sentence. A New York Times article dated June 5, 1977, stated DeBella allocated the Persicals, 15 out of 33 memberships, allowed since the books reopened. By 1979, Persico was free from prison and the official Colombo boss. An interesting theory, with no factual basis, is that Persico had his people plan the attack on Colombo, fully knowing Gallo would get the blame for it. In essence, killing two birds with one stone while paving the way for him to take over. But who knows? What is known 
is Persko's time on the street as a boss was not long lived. In 1981, Persico attended a high-level meeting with fellow members of Cosa Nostra, one of whom was New Jersey boss Sam DeCavacante. That meeting violated the terms of his parole, to which he surrendered the service time for the violation. But months later, in November 1981, he would plead to a criminal conspiracy case in which he would serve an additional four years. Once back on the street, Persico literally didn't even have a year's run. In October 1984, after learning the Colombo leadership was about to be indicted on a racketeering case, Persico became a fugitive, which resulted in a nationwide manhunt and landing him on one of the 10 most wanted lists. On February 15, 1985, Persico was captured at a house on Wanto, Long Island. Ten days later, the government indicted nine people in what would become known as the commission case. Persico subsequently was added to that indictment. In April 1985, Persico and top leaders of the Colombo family were charged in a 51-count superseding indictment. By June 1986, Persico was convicted in the Colombo trial and sentenced to 39 years. During the commission trial, he opted to serve as his own lawyer, and on November 19, 1986, Persico and his co-defendants were all convicted. He was sentenced in January 1987 to a 100-year sentence. I previously gave my opinion as to a boss who receives a sentence with no hope of ever seeing the street again. I believe he should step down. Carmine Persico did not share that same opinion and went and relinquished control of the Colombo family. He quickly named his brother, Alley Boy, as acting boss. But he too would be headed to prison for loan sharking. Persico then approved the Colombo ruling panel, which only lasted a short time. The next person he chose to be placed in the active boss position would prove to be one that he definitely regretted. Little Vicarina became the Colombo's new acting boss in 1988 and did so knowing that he was only warming the seat for Persico's son, Little Alley Boy, who at the time had a few years left to serve on a sentence. Nonetheless, things didn't go according to plan. Coincidentally, one of the reasons Persico decided on placing Arena in the acting boss position was money. As I keep mentioning, M-O-N-E-Y is how the mob spells loyalty. Apparently, Arena's crew was kicking up millions of dollars to the family. Arena took a new liking to being the boss, so much so that he began to get a bad taste in his mouth whenever Persico would send an order for him from prison. And the thought of having to step down and hand everything over to Persico's son made him develop a dislike for the Persicos. John Gotti, a close friend of Arena, began pushing him to make a play for the official position. Naturally, Arena voiced his complaints to Gotti, but Gotti had an ulterior motive for the advice he gave his friend. He was attempting to outvote Chinjigante during commission rulings, and he needed Arena as an ally in order to do that. Eventually, Arena appealed to commission members to anoint him as the official Colombo boss, and supposedly they refused to get involved and told him to use protocol by polling the captains and let them take a vote. Let's not forget, one person who sat on the commission was Chin, a seasoned boss who more than likely knew of the Arena Gotti connection. As the saying goes, Arena and Gotti were playing checkers while Chin sat back and played chess and delivered his checkmate to Gotti. Let me quickly mention, in lieu of Patreon, I point out the Super Thanks icon, which can be found under the video by clicking on the three-dot drop-down put there for anyone who'd like to show appreciation for videos like this. Acting on the commission's advice, Arena spoke to Carmine Sessa, the family's consigliere, about polling the captains to see if they felt he should be the official boss. Sessa did no such thing, and instead sent word to Persico exposing Arena's intentions. Instinctively, Persico sent word back to immediately take Arena out. On June 21, 1991, a Colombo hit team sat on Arena's Long Island house. But Arena, being on alert, spotted the guys in the car and sped away. Once again, adding strength to my saying, some people call it paranoid, I call it being smart. This was the start of another Colombo war, one which numerous members were killed on both sides, including innocent bystanders and one 18-year-old killed by mistaken identity. The chaos continued until the arrest of over 80 members and associates, including Vic Arena. When the dust settled, the Persico faction was victorious and remained in control of the family, which more than likely made Carmine Persico think to himself, I got nothing but loyalty out there.